The three unsolved cases in this video all have something in common, but you'll need to watch to the end to find out what it is. From a young girl who vanished into thin air on the way down to meet a friend at her penthouse apartment building's pool, to a young boy who skipped school and bought a one-way ticket to London. There is something that connects all of these cases. Buckle up as we dive into the bizarre twists and turns of a few of the most puzzling unsolved cases of all time. And welcome to the Unsolved Society. On Saturday, June 25th, 1983, four-year-old Nyleen Marshall vanished while catching frogs with other children during an event along the shallow Maupin Creek in the Helena National Forest of Montana. Nyleen was attending a ham radio operator's picnic with the rest of her family. Her adoptive father, Kim, her mother, Nancy, and her two siblings, Nathan and Noreen. That day, Nyleen and a few other children decided to play along the bank of a creek and search for frogs. It's been reported that the other children Nyleen was playing with at the time saw her talking to an unknown man wearing a purple jogging suit. A six-year-old boy who was there at the time claimed to have seen Nyleen say, the man wants me to follow the shadow. It's been assumed that this was actually an attempt to lure Nyleen away from the others by tempting her to play a game. Whoever this man is, is the last known person to be seen with her before she vanished. An intense search began with over 2,800 volunteers, helicopters, and police canines. They also conducted a thorough search of nearby mine shafts and ponds, but found nothing. After five days of searching, the investigator's optimism began to wane as a harsh storm rolled in. By day 10, there was still no evidence discovered and the search effort was officially called off. But the Marshall family did not stop there. Nyleen's face was plastered on billboards, milk cartons, shopping bags, etc. But the investigation continued to hit dead ends. It wasn't until 1985, so two years after Nyleen's disappearance, when the person who investigators believe is responsible for her disappearance began to make strange attempts at communication with various missing children's organizations and the police. On November 27, 1985, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received an ominous anonymous call from a man claiming he was the one that took Nyleen. But it wasn't until two months later that a typed letter was sent to law enforcement in Wisconsin with some strange and disturbing details enclosed. In that letter, postmarked from Madison, Wisconsin, a man claims that he took who he now refers to as Kay, which is actually Nyleen, and that she was now living with him, traveling the world, and being homeschooled. He also claimed to be feeding her a spoonful of his bodily fluid daily absolutely vile. <laughs> I'll go ahead and read a few excerpts from the letter that were shown during an episode of Unsolved Mysteries back in 1990, but I am going to admit the detail I just mentioned previously. I didn't want their person to try to get information from her. All I could tell them was that she was okay. I hope Child Find can get the following back to her family. I picked up Kay up on the road in Elkhorn Park area between Helena and Boulder. She was crying and frightened as I held her. She was shaking and I decided that I would keep her and love her. I took her home with me. I have a nice investment income and I can work from home. So I take care of her myself all the time. I teach her at home and she likes to go with me when I travel. Her hair is short and curly now and she has really grown. She is 45 inches and around 50 pounds. She has all four of her permanent upper and two of her lower incisors at this time. She takes a bath and brushes her teeth every day. She eats well. Her favorite meal is pizza and cherry. Excerpt 2. She would gladly recount you the trips to San Francisco, New York, Oklahoma City, New Orleans, Nashville, Chicago, Puerto Rico, and Canada. We were even in Britain for a month last year and she loved it. Nobody questions passports. It is or where it comes from, only that I get it from the bathroom every morning. It is actually a spoonful of my... It doesn't affect her physically. I have never her in any other way. She is a sweet little girl, and it is because of how much I have grown to love her that I realize how much her family must miss her. But she is adjusted and seems happy. She trusts me and isn't afraid. We play a lot, and she laughs when we clown around. She smiles and acts coy when I tease her. She giggles when we snuggle and hugs sometimes for no apparent reason. 
I love her and I have her. I just can't let her go. Now, around the same time, multiple phone calls were made to Child Vine of America, a nonprofit based in New York, by someone claiming to be the writer of that letter. These calls were actually traced and came back to various phone booths and a pharmacy near Edgerton, Wisconsin. The FBI was able to confirm that all of these phone calls and the letter had come from the same person. The suspect then sent a final letter to investigators claiming to have actually killed Nyleen and hid her body in a mine shaft. That mine shaft was searched, but nothing was found. Years later, the Marshall family ended up relocating to Japan, but were in the process of moving to Mexico due to Kim Marshall and Eileen adoptive father's job. Nancy Marshall and Eileen's mother had flown to Mexico to look for new homes for the family, while Kim stayed back in Japan with the two remaining children. In a heartbreaking turn of events, Nancy was actually brutally assaulted and murdered in her hotel room at the ritzy Radisson Paraiso Hotel in Mexico City. To add insult to injury, the Mexican authorities claimed her death was a suicide initially, but the details of her death were clearly a homicide. Kim Marshall fought a lengthy battle trying to bring justice to those responsible, but stopped pushing for the investigation once it became quote-unquote unsafe. Just heartbreaking to think about the trauma that Kim and the remaining Marshall children must have lived through. The most recent update in this case came in 2017 when Jefferson County Sheriff Craig Doolittle stated that law enforcement still had no substantial leads in Nyleen's case. Many wonder if Nyleen is still alive today and maybe just unaware of her true identity or if she really did meet foul play on that Saturday by the creek in 1983. We still have no idea what really happened to Nyleen that day. I'd like to take a moment to invite you to subscribe to my channel and formally become an official solver at the Unsolved Society. Official solvers must have an eagerness to learn about unsolved true crime and mysteries, but also be willing to commit at least 20 minutes a week watching a new video by yours truly about some of the most bizarre unsolved cases in history. I don't think that's asking too much, right? So subscribe today for new weekly unsolved true crime and mystery videos and become an official solver today. On September 14th, 2007, Andrew Gosden diverted from his usual routine of boarding the bus and attending school and instead chose to purchase a one-way train ticket to London from his home in South Yorkshire, England. Once Andrew arrived in London, he was never heard from again. At the time of his disappearance, Andrew was a 14-year-old young man who was described by his loved ones as very intelligent, introverted, caring, and thoughtful. He was also enrolled in the Young, Gifted, and Talented program at his school and was noted as being particularly gifted in mathematics. He had a perfect attendance record and always got straight A's on his report cards. He was described as an introvert who would rather stay home, read, and play video games rather than going out with a bunch of friends. It has been noted in the weeks leading up to his disappearance that instead of taking the bus home from school like normal, Andrew decided to walk four miles from Macaulay Catholic High School to his home. It's still unknown why in the week leading up to his disappearance that he made that decision. On the morning of September 14th, 2007, the day of his disappearance, Andrew had trouble waking up in the morning and was noted as being irritable by his mother, Glynis. This was not normal behavior for Andrew. That morning, a family friend did witness Andrew walking across Westfield Park and heading towards his usual bus stop just after 8 a.m. It was at this time Andrew veered from his normal routine and stopped at a nearby ATM where he withdrew 200 pounds from his bank account, leaving only 14 pounds remaining. After he stopped at the ATM, CCTV footage showed Andrew returning home. It was at this time he changed his clothes and packed a bag with his PlayStation handheld console keys, and a wallet. Now, it's also been noted that he left important items behind, like his passport, 100 pounds of birthday money, and the charger for that PlayStation portable handheld console. It wasn't until that evening that the Gosdens sat down to eat dinner that they realized Andrew never came home. They had assumed at the time he was either in his room or in the basement playing video games. They contacted the school and learned that Andrew was absent for the first time ever, ruining his perfect attendance record. Immediately, the family was extremely concerned about his whereabouts and officially reported him missing. 
A ticket attendant from the train station in Doncaster would come forward to police and claim that she re remembered selling a one-way ticket to Andrew. She claimed that when the young boy approached her to buy a one-way ticket to London, she tried to convince him to instead buy a round-trip ticket because it was less expensive. However, she claims he was insistent that he only needed a one-way ticket. CCTV footage was able to confirm the woman's story and caught Andrew boarding that train to London. A passenger on that train claimed to have sat next to Andrew on the trip and described him as quiet and concentrated on his video game. Andrew would arrive at King's Cross Station in London around 11.20 a.m. and was captured leaving the train station around 11.25 a.m. This is the last confirmed sighting of Andrew Gosden. In the days and weeks following Andrew's disappearance, his family grappled with the different possibilities for why he chose to divert from all of his normal behavior. There were several reported sightings of Andrew from a pizza hut on Oxford Street to possibly being seen at Covent Garden the same day. Unfortunately, investigators failed to request the CCTV footage from nearby businesses in a timely manner. And by the time that they did, it had already been deleted. Due to a lack of evidence, the case quickly went cold. Over the years, various other reported sightings were made to police. However, none of them were able to be confirmed. However, I do think it's interesting to note that in 2018, someone had reached out to the Gosden family to report an eerie conversation they had with someone named Andy Rue online. The tipster claims the person they were talking to stated, quote unquote, my partner has just walked out and I need help. When they asked what they needed, the user stated he needed 200 pounds to make rent. So the random internet do-gooder offered to transfer some money, but Andy Rue stated he didn't have a bank account because he left home at 14. In a strange coincidence, it was revealed that Andy Rue was the same nickname given to Andrew by his family as a child. When law enforcement reached out to the site admins in an attempt to uncover the poster's true identity, they hit another dead end when it was revealed that the website had recently changed systems, resulting in a loss of data, so they were never able to track down the true identity of Andy Rue. In January 2022, two men were arrested in connection with Gosden's disappearance. They were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and human trafficking charges. It also was reported that the two men had numerous devices seized for forensic investigation. However, in September 2023, both men were released without charges and police stated they were not involved in Gosden's disappearance. Whether Andrew left on his own accord or there was some underlying sinister motivation for why he decided to travel to London alone that day has never been determined. The investigation into Andrew's disappearance is still active today. What do you think drove Andrew to do something that was so out of character like skipping school and buying a train ticket? Do you think he left on his own accord or did he have an outside influence? Comment below. Our final case continues to baffle investigators and has gone down as the largest missing person investigation in Toronto history. On July 30th, 1985, Nicole Morin left her 20th floor penthouse apartment to meet a friend in the lobby as the two were planning to visit the condo building swimming pool. But between the time she walked out of her front door to the time she exited the elevator, she vanished into thin air and has never been seen again. Nicole Morin was born on April 1st, 1977 to Arthur or Art and Jeanette Morin. The two had been married 12 years before Nicole was born. At the time of her disappearance, the two were separated and Nicole was living with her mother while her father resided in nearby Mississauga. She was described as a normal little girl with lots of friends who had a happy-go-lucky attitude. On the day of her disappearance, Nicole was seen on her way to the lobby to pick up her mother's mail at around 10.30 a.m. She returned back to her apartment where she spoke with, to her friend via the intercom and the two agreed to meet downstairs in the lobby shortly to go to the pool. It was at this time Nicole packed a plastic bag containing a white t-shirt, green and white shorts, sand town lotion, a hairbrush, a peach colored blanket, and a purple beach towel. She also changed into a peach colored one piece bathing suit paired with a green hairband and red canvas shoes. 15 minutes later, Jennifer, the friend she was meeting downstairs, buzzed up to Nicole's apartment to see why she hadn't shown up yet. She spoke to Nicole's mother, who ran a small child daycare out of their apartment and was busy attending to the other children. 
Her mother stated that Nicole had already left to go to the pool and maybe she was playing with other children at the back of the complex. Unfortunately, it wasn't until 3 p.m. that day that her mother would report her officially missing to police. Once the police were informed of Nicole's disappearance, a large search effort began. The police knocked on all 429 units in the apartment building to search for any clues about the missing girl's whereabouts. Due to the sensitive and the urgent nature of the search, police entered the resident apartments even if they didn't answer their doors. During this effort, a woman came forward with information that Nicole had traveled down the elevator and entered the lobby. However, no other details were provided. The next day, police chose to expand their search using mounted horsemen, boats, and search helicopters. Canine units were also brought in to search the building's underground garage, utility room storage units, and sump pup rooms. The Toronto Crime Stoppers organization had just been created and took on Nicole as their first case. Thousands of missing posters showing Marin's picture were distributed through the community. Toronto police even formed a 20-person task force that was dedicated to her case for more than nine months, totaling over 25,000 man-hours that were devoted to exploring incoming leads. By November of that year, police had questioned over 6,000 people regarding Nicole's disappearance, bringing that first year's investigation cost to an estimated $1.8 million. Gosh, I just can't help but think when hearing that number, the injustice for other missing people that aren't given the same amount of resources to solve their disappearance. It's just, it's sad. During the investigation, a haunting discovery was made. A strange diary injury that had been written months earlier by Nicole was found. In the entry, she wrote, quote unquote, I'm going to disappear. Obviously, children are known to say some strange and outlandish things sometimes. However, given the recent events, the police thought the discovery was noteworthy. It wasn't until 2020 that a woman came forward and said that when she was 12 years old, she had actually seen Nicole at a nearby park on the day that she disappeared. When investigators questioned the woman about why she had waited so long to come forward, she claimed that when she saw Nicole that day, she was with a man and that man had her previously, making her extremely fearful to come forward to investigators. Law enforcement obviously thought something was credible about this lead, so they chose to search that park with cadaver dogs, who ended up getting a hit. They even ex excavated certain areas in the park, but they did not end up finding anything. In 2000, Nicole's mother passed away, but her father, Art, is still desperate and hopeful to find out what really happened to his daughter. To this day, Toronto police still have a full-time investigator dedicated to her case, and they are still offering a $100,000 reward for her safe return. So what's the commonality between all three of these cases? All three of these lesser known unsolved disappearances have continued to baffle investigators and loved ones of the missing to this day. According to the Global Missing Kids Organization, more than 460,000 children go missing every year from the United States alone. The UK has 113,000 children go missing, while Canada hovers around 45,000. These numbers are jarring. If you or anyone you know has information about the whereabouts of Nyleen Marshall, Andrew Gosden, or Nicole Morin, please visit the International Center for Missing Children at www.icmec.org, where you can fill out an online form to leave an anonymous tip. Thank you very much for watching this video. As always, comment below what strange and bizarre unsolved case you want me to cover next. Also, like this video and subscribe to my channel for more unsolved cases like the ones we covered today. I will see you solvers in the next video. Bye.